Like this plank. This, you'll do this or something. I'll give you a thumbs up. Put your hands like this when you want me to talk. All right, good, uh, good morning, folks. We want to welcome you to um, our second uh, Tri-County debate of the year here at Carmichael's High School. Uh, due to the COVID uh, crisis, if you will, the last couple of years, our debates have been kind of minimized. We were very excited to get back and give our students an opportunity to debate uh, that we've missed for a few years. We have, we have a lot of new uh, students who maybe are somewhat inexperienced with speaking uh, publicly up on stage here. Um, but we ask you guys to just relax, take a deep breath, and do the best that you can. And I think it'll be a great experience for, for those of you who did not get a chance to do this at the previous debate in Jefferson. We'll have a pro side and a con side. They'll each come up, one from each side, share their position. We'll go down through, and then, then they'll each they will each question each other to a certain degree, and then later after that, we will open up questions for the uh, the crowd, the the audience to interject and have some questions. And we have a, a somewhat of a time constraint, but if the topic seems to get have a lot of uh, popularity, we may extend that slightly. Uh, but again, remember we're being live streamed now as well, so be mindful of. Uh, Anything that you would say, but obviously we're going to be very, very respectful and tactful in our arguments. We have a well, pre well prepared, fine group of students, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our student moderator today uh, at Carmichael's, Mr. Jacob Fordyce. He will be handling uh, the uh, organization and running of this uh, fine debate we're about to have. I want to also extend a very warm thank you to all of. Uh, the Carmichael's debate team for their help in getting this organized, as well as the coaches from the neighboring schools and all their support. And uh, I think it's going to be a fine event. I'm very excited about it. Without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Jacob Fordyce. Indeed. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's get this started off. Can I have our debaters for the pro and con for the increase of minimum wage? Thank you. to get anybody else. Like, so you don't want the tables. Can we now have our first positive speaker? Okay. The minimum wage currently does not do justice for the current working climate we are in today. It is outdated, it's outdated, and it's not been adjusted in 13 years. Also, I believe that Raising the minimum wage will actually help smaller businesses. To my first point, the minimum wage is outdated and should be adjusted for the current working climate. The minimum wage has not been increased since 2009, and to put that in perspective, increase inflation has increased by 31.05% and has not changed a penny since then. To my second point, increasing the minimum wage will actually help smaller businesses. If we pay workers across the country more money, they'll have more disposable income to spend at those smaller businesses and to help those smaller business, businesses thrive. Now we'll go over that more in our later presenters, but now that gives the survival of those smaller businesses to the communities that they are in. Instead of the big businesses just taking over and killing them because they have way too much money anyways. That's just the basis that we're going off of. Now, to my last point, the minimum wage was made to be a living wage and needs to continue to be. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a father of the minimum wage, and he said, the law I have just signed was passed to put people back to work, to let them buy more, 
more products from farms and factories and start businesses at a living rate again. He started the minimum wage to be a living wage, to help those workers in all facets to have a, at least some type of a living wage and to at least have some sort of safety net with them. Now, that is how he brought us out of the depression. With this, it helps inflation, it helps the economy and stuff, especially when you raise your bottom line up. Now, to conclude, the minimum wage, wage of today is outdated and outdated does not work for the current climate of our workers. The benefits of a higher minimum wage could actually help smaller businesses with more, when they have more of a disposable income. The bottom line is to provide a living wage for the common good and stop the exploitation of American workers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear our first negative statement. Good morning. Increasing the minimum wage in our country could have potentially disastrous consequences for the very people that this measure is said to help, starting with the alleged job loss and unemployment that would ensue. This unemployment would be concentrated within people who are considered lower skilled workers due to a lack of education or prior work experience. Consumer prices for the entire country could also be negatively affected. Therefore, the new minimum wage measure would be counterproductive altogether due to inflation. Furthermore, this measure would not harm big businesses that seem to monopolize the present market. Instead, it could actually harm the small businesses that exist in our communities who have already suffered major losses due to the pandemic. In short, the federal minimum wage has not been raised since 2009 for a deliberate reason. The potential harmful consequences outweigh the benefits that our country could reap from this dangerous measure. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from our second positive debater. Research has shown that raising the minimum wage uh, has no significant job loss. According to the University of California Berkeley Center on Wage and Employment Dynamics, in states like Chicago, Oakland, Seattle, San Francisco, and San Jose, that raise their wages see no effect on workers' fear of layoffs. A 1998 EPI study found no significant job loss associated with the 1996-97 wage increase. Studies by Alan Kruger of several states wage increase found no measurable negative impact on employment. We'll now hear our second negative debate. First, with an increase in minimum wage, many minimum wage or lower paid workers would lose their jobs. For example, I work at a public library. It's federally funded and a nonprofit organization. I have 10 other co-workers and we all make $10 or under per hour. If the minimum wage were to be raised, I, along with over half of my co-workers, would lose our jobs. Isn't the point of minimum wage to improve living standards for minimum wage workers? If they no longer have their jobs, the living standards are anything but improved. We'll now hear our third positive statement. would reduce government welfare spending. If low-income workers earn more money, their dependence on government benefits would decrease. The Center for American Progress reported in 2014 that raising the federal minimum wage by 6% to $10.10 would reduce spending on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, by 6% or $4.6 billion. The Economic Policy Institute determined that by increasing the minimum, minimum wage to $10.10, more than 1.7 million Americans would no longer be dependent on government assistance programs. They report the increase would shave $7.6 billion off annual government spending on income support programs. We'll now hear our third negative statement. An article stated by Inside of New Jersey states that the legislation is moving quickly to enact 815. 
uh, and that is currently trying to allow $15 minimum wage in New Jersey. A statement coming from NPR.org on the latest hard of minimum wage news states that the retail giant currently pays $15 per hour starting wage, but said Monday that it would begin paying workers from $15 an hour to $24 an hour. Now, minimum wage is different everywhere, but since in PA right now, I'm going to tell you that the minimum wage federally in PA is $7.25. That compared to $15 an hour is $7.75 difference. That's over two times the federal minimum wage. A statement by Investopia.com states that inflation is a measurement of rate of rising prices of goods and services in the economy. Inflation can occur when prices rise due to, to increase in population, such as raw materials and wages. It's not based on taxes. It's not based on national debt. It's based on wage and the cost reduction of wage. Thank you. We'll now hear our fourth positive statement. According to researchers at MIT, the $7.25 wage is not enough to cover the cost of full-time workers in any state in the United States. In 2013, a poll by Oxfam America said 66% of U.S. workers earning less than $10 an hour report that they just meet or don't have enough to meet their basic living expenses. And 50% said they are frequently worried about not affording basic living expenses such as food or medicine. A 2015 report by the Alliance for a Just Society found that the federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour represents less than half of living wage for a single adult. And workers supporting only himself would have to work 93 hours a week at the federal minimum wage in order to make the ends meet or skip necessities like meals or medicine. According to the Congressional Bus Budget Office, Putting money into the pockets of lower class Americans will not only benefit them, but it will give them the, the ability to reinvest into the economy, therefore stimulating growth. We'll now hear our fourth negative statement. According to the website BLS.gov, only 55.5% of workers in the U.S. are paid at hourly rates. On top of this, 1.9% of these workers are paid minimum wage, meaning that this increase in minimum wage would not reach as many people as is widely thought. Along with this, if the minimum wage were to be, were to be raised, the general expenses of employers would be increased, leading to inflation for the services or goods provided. Unemployment would also increase because of the expenses for the company being raised. We'll now hear our fifth positive statement. As we were facing the worldwide pandemic, minimum wage workers were described as essential workers because they do the jobs that everyone relies on to keep everyday life moving forward. Without these workers, our lives would not be the same. Knowing this, why would we be paying them a wage that's impossible to live on, let alone raise a family and thrive on? I am of the radical belief that hardworking Americans, essential workers, deserve to be paid enough to cover their basic needs and expenses to live. We'll now hear our fifth negative statement. If the federal minimum wage was increased, many companies' employers would lower their profit margins. These profit margins are allowed, allowed for allow creation of new, new jobs and employment opportunities. These same employment opportunities are what supply a employee with the basic needs, basic funds to complete their needs. The positive side has finished their statement and we'll now hear from the negative side.
Although there are many benefits that United States citizens would gain from an increased minimum wage, there are also many detriments that may go unforeseen. As stated in the exposition, the majority of the United States employees are paid hourly, roughly 55.5% according to BLS.gov, meaning that the majority of workers will experience one or many of these downfalls. Overall, we believe that these downfalls outweigh the benefits. The minimum wage should not be increased. Thank you. We'll now be asking table to table questions. Go ahead, guys. Um, I'd like to present a question to the first speaker. You made a statement regarding that you believe that raising the minimum wage would help, would actually help small businesses. However, our research actually suggests the exact opposite. According to the Congressional Budget Office, um, raising a projected $15 minimum wage by the year 2025 could result in an average of 1.4 million jobs lost, a fall in business revenues leading to a $9 billion drop in real income, income and increases in the prices of goods and services across the economy. How do you... What do you have to combat that? So what I think is, sorry. So for the minimum wage being increased, the only reason that that it would help smaller businesses is to give more disposable income to the people. So they don't have to just live off of the necessities for life, as like Jasmine said. So with that income, they can help smaller businesses uh, to then spend more money there. So rather than bigger businesses where they could sell more products for cheaper. And that just gives the hand of the smaller, uh, smaller businesses to the communities themselves to work in. So, was there anything that missed? Or... Not only would it help small businesses, but also if a small business cannot pay enough to support their employees a living wage, do they really deserve to be having that business and running that business if they can't take care of their own workers? That's the question I'd like to pose. I believe the, I agree that a, that a small business should be able to adequately pay their workers. However, the research according to the the American Action Forum, it's stating that if we increase the minimum wage, this will thus increase inflation, which will overall raise the standard of living, which will make a raise in the federal minimum wage counterproductive. Because if you're paying the employees more than the items they're buying, those prices are also going to increase. So it's going to level out and we'll be at the same predicament that we find ourselves in currently. I'd like to pose the question, what would you do in response to the poverty that we face, besides raising the minimum wage to an actual living wage. Yeah, so regarding the pottery, we actually did um, research stating that if we were to institute a $15 federal minimum wage, this is still under about $3,000 under the federal um, poverty line, not regarding taxes. And that's according to uh, the IRS.gov. The IRS so of course, so even then, even with this federal minimum wage, that still would not, it would help some people with the poverty line, but not across the board. So how does this support your point that we shouldn't increase it when millions of Americans will be profiting and reinvesting back into the economy? So as um, you, I forget your name, sorry, um, Luke, said, um, there's only about 1.9% of Americans that are currently being paid at the 1.9 out of 55% of all workers that are being paid by the um, minimum wage standards. By raising it, it would force um, employers like my employer that I'm already gaining more than the minimum wage to be put at 
and baseline the minimum wage, which could provide problems. There isn't as many people at minimum wage at the moment where if we change it, it would actually increase the amount of people being paid at it. Um, I would like to clear up the number that about 1.8 million workers in America earn wages at or below the federal minimum wage. And the hourly workers that you were um, talking about earlier, um, you mentioned 55.5% uh, make and make hourly wages. I would like to point out that that is over half of the workforce. Yeah. I'd just like to clarify where, what source you are seeing that from because according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and of course this is in the year 2020, I'm seeing that about 1.1 million workers with wages at or below the federal minimum. I actually got mine from the Bureau of Labor Statistics as well. And even though millions of Americans would profit from the minimum wage, millions more would lose their jobs too. I have studies that I just said that is false. That's why it was like my entire thing. So, also, Could you provide a little bit more reference to that? Uh, just to reiterate your point? Uh, it was in my speech, but. Uh, uh, Economic Policy Institute said whenever they raised the minimum wage in 1996, uh, there was no significant job loss. I counter that that is about 28 years ago, 25 plus years ago, and also another research study, I don't, I can't remember if it was you or a person before, you referenced a research in California raising the minimum wage in certain counties in California, and I ventured that that is only in one state out of the 50 in America, so I don't know if that is going to hold up if we are going to talk about a over nationwide federal minimum wage increase. Wait, what are you saying? <laughs> Someone mentioned a study that was performed in California cal counties, and I'm, I'm only reiterating that that is not a nationwide study. That is only in one state out of the 50. It also America. doesn't say nationally in the top. It says minimum wage should be increased. So you can look at that in multiple ways. Federal minimum wage. The current events... <laughs> the current events uh, that we're most likely debating on following how most of these debates go is the federal um, minimum wage being increased to $15 an hour. So that's what we gained our um, info and um, intelligence based off of um, versus a lower minimum wage per state or countywide. So we're basing our argument on a living wage, not $15 an hour. And statistically, that is. Um, sorry, that. Living wage. A living wage is has to be over $16 an hour. So that's what we're asking, that's what we're asking for. Just six kind of like the Okay, price. well, we were using 15 as our number, so we're similar results then. Okay. okay. All right, that's going to be all the questions we'll table to take. Now we'll go ahead and open the questions up to the audience, so if you have anything, let us know. Oh, you're not. No. Okay, go ahead, bro. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier, this is uh, the question for the gentleman all the way to the right. Hi. Um, so you mentioned earlier that if the minimum wage were to be raised that at your employment, you stated that you were already paid above minimum wage. You said that raising the minimum wage would cause problems for you? What not, problems specifically would that? Not specific problems for me, but I'm already being paid about 10 bucks an hour at the job that I'm, I'm currently working at. And although the minimum wage is at 725, if it was increased to $15 an hour, um, my employer would be forced to, of course, at minimum $15 an hour, where there's my argument was that we're talking about a very small percentage of people in the hourly working class that um, people above the minimum wage would still be affected to a certain degree. Right, so you said 1.9% makes minimum wage, 55%, 55, sorry, 55.5% make hourly wages. Of total workers. So is it affecting 1.9 or are you saying it's affecting 5.5? The 1.9 is um, 
just minimum wage. The 55.5 is the whole spectrum. I don't have a specific number on how, how many workers are making under the $15 an hour that would be, as I said, that we would be working on, but it would affect more than just the 1.9, but less than the 55.5. She has her bottle to so that range. Well, according to the U.S. Bureau of I'm Labor... I'm so sorry. I, I, my question is, how would that negatively affect you? You said that there could be negative ramifications for raising it. How? You didn't elaborate on that. Again, I said that this wouldn't affect me specifically. I said it would affect Your my employer. employer. What was that? Your employer? Yeah, I was, I was just... Yes, yeah. I said my employer, not me specifically. What problems, though? Well, they'd have to pay me more, which in the oh, business no. that I work at, we have very small um, profit margins, and I'm as a um, extra pair of hands when needed only at the moment already. So it's kind of a on top of things that when they need me, it's for a pretty important thing usually. So making them have to pay me more would make the um, business that I'm in um, require more wages for certain things on the employee um, rate versus things, which ultimately comes back to the consumer. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Go ahead, right there. Um, I have a question for the con side. Uh, you did, uh, Blaine did say that uh, most of the, uh, well, if you take the minimum wage will increase, like the companies will lose money. Do you have an estimated guess on how much money that the company, like the big companies like Google and like Coca-Cola will like uh, lose to gain the minimum wage? Um, I do not have specific for the specific companies, but as I stated, according to the Congressional Budget Office, there would be about a $9 billion drop in income from those business, in those business revenues. Thank you. You're we'll go ahead up front right here. Which one? Uh, right here. Thank you. I have a question for uh, Pro. Uh, Specifically, though maybe not exclusively to number one. Um, so you said that something along the lines of that. Um, so you, uh, okay, now, nah, I'm stuttering, I know I'm messing up. So you were saying that uh, with an increase in the minimum wage, uh, the consumers will have more finances to spend at smaller businesses to afford the higher prices that, you know, will generally be provided by smaller businesses. But um, as it was said by, I believe, number five, that um, if a, a business can't afford to pay its uh, employees, then it shouldn't, uh, I, I'm not like, I'm sorry, I'm, you're fine. <laughs> okay, I'm just, I'm having trouble speaking here. If, so if, do you want us to come back to you? Yeah, you can come back okay. to Any of you guys else there, go ahead. Uh, uh, can I stand? Uh, okay, so this is for pro side. You, most of your arguments were about how if the lower class got more money, they can then redistribute it back to the economy and it will bolster growth. But again, small businesses cannot compare to biz big businesses the same. Big businesses, big businesses have more marketing advertisements and reach a larger demographic. That's why large businesses like Amazon is rising while our mall is shutting down. And because of that, you're cutting out the whole entire demographic of small businesses. You're stifling entrepreneurship at that point. That is the effect of a smaller minimum wage. So that's when you get those smaller businesses that are suffering, really, because you don't have, well, at least for the minimum wage workers, you don't have the money to spend at those smaller businesses. So by doing that to kind of, like you said, redistribute the money to it, then that will help them, is what I'm getting at. Just because they wouldn't be making that money if people didn't have the money to spend there. 
Well, what I'm saying is, people always look towards those large businesses first because they're more well known. I mean, less money will be one of these small businesses. They'll always be distributed more to a big business instead of the small. I would rather take a chip. I would rather take a chance of maybe a small business thriving than no chance at all because the bigger businesses are just going to take it because they have the product for a cheaper price. Because that just puts the decision of those smaller businesses in the hands of consumers to then go on and make their own decisions. So that's just the basis of, of our system is to kind of pick and choose what uh, businesses we want to thrive and just go on from there. So I'd rather have the chance than just to kill them all together. But when it, if they don't have enough money to pay their workers now because of this new system, that's killing them anyways, isn't it? They would be making more money so they could pay more money to their workers, is what I'm getting at. They're making more money from their raising of the minimum wage because people are getting paid more. No. So they're spending more money at those businesses. Because they have to pay their workers more though. Yes, they do. They're but they're losing a profit. It's a deficit in their profit, though. Yes. Most businesses take deficits in their profits from you know, wages. But they will be making more money because more people can go there and buy stuff. Oh, one second. She has that. I would also like to add that poverty stifles entrepreneurship and having so many people in poverty due to the minimum wage is um, the problem from the source. That, that is the source of the issue in the first place. And going off of what I said about how businesses who can't afford to pay their workers correctly don't deserve to have a business, I have an issue with framing this as the poor small businesses when we, we need to set a standard. We need to set a good standard, and that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to set a standard of living and of wages, because as a business, that's what you should be doing anyway. I have a problem with framing this as um, we should be suffering because businesses don't want to pay us. All right, thank you. Uh, We're going to have a final bubble real quick. I would just like clarification in your overall argument. So you are arguing that in raising the minimum wage, these minimum wage workers are now going to pour that money that they are now earning into the into these small businesses that will help the small businesses grow. However, you are also arguing that they need this money for their cost of living, for basic necessities. So I'm just wondering the correlation, like how small businesses will grow with this new money in the economy from the raising of the minimum wage if that money is going to go into their basic necessities, such as food, housing, etc. Um, they will go to both. And I'd also, just before I hand this over, I'd like to point out a source from the Congressional Budget Office that um, stating that this will give um, reinvestment back into the economy, stating that that is a true statement just before we set the ground. So you were saying, sorry, could you uh, restate your question? So basically, you were, you, someone stated previously that you believe that small businesses will grow because of the raising the minimum wage, because those minimum wage workers will pour that money back into those small businesses. However, in the same breath, you're also stating that the, these minimum wage workers need a raise in the minimum wage in order to live, because their standard of living is low and they need these basic necessities, such as food, housing, etc. Yeah, I think it's going to be most important to get those people at least on their feet and out of the poverty line. And from there, then you can have a, uh, a bigger economy to work with, those smaller businesses. So they, again, they might not thrive, but that's just how our system works. So we can build off of that, even if it's not an immediate uh, response to it. We can build off of that in our future economy, in our, in our future, as it is, with a higher minimum wage and more disposable income for everybody to use just to keep up with inflation. So you are saying the minimum wage, raising the minimum wage, the effects will not be, the positive effects will not occur to these small businesses immediately. It will be down the line, years, decades. I wouldn't say decades, I would probably say uh, years, but it more or less kicks in just through how our system is built. So that's the innovation of the American workers as a whole. We need to get those people out of the poverty line before we can even talk about moving our country forward. Because if we have 
like a quarter of our population, um, that's not a statistic, I'm just uh, paraphrasing, but if we have a big portion of our uh, sorry, population in the poverty line, then they cannot spend that money where we want it to be for a, a company to, sorry, increase, to be better. Okay, thank you. All right, that'll be all. Okay, uh, please Hey, you to go? Awesome, go ahead, sir. Uh, for the post side, you said that, or no, 1.9% of workers are at the minimum wage level or below, right? And by increasing the minimum wage, I found a statistic from fee.gov or fee.org, it's one of the two, that for every 10% increase in minimum wage, there's a 5% increase in food prices and a 1% increase in every other price. So by though increasing the minimum wage would help bolster this 1.9%, is it worth it to increase prices for the for everybody again to 100%? Short answer, yes. It's worth it to lift people out of poverty and give them a basic standard of living. And the consequences follow just as the consequences of poverty right now follows. Um, by raising the standard, that's the only place you can start when addressing these issues. Everything else follows, as, as we stayed with reinvesting back into the economy. And it's, it's pretty much, um, this is how our system works. And we need to have a good baseline in order to have it functioning at all. Well, by raising the minimum wage, you're also raising taxes for every single person as well. And it's a, a one to one half ratio, which overall I don't feel is a very good decision. If you're bolstering a small percentage of people, but hindering a giant, like 100% of everybody, then the overall debt that America would be in could be higher and it could also just cause systemic issues for everybody else. I would like to see some kind of evidence about how disastrous these would actually be, these effects. Uh, I don't have any specific evidence. So just one more uh, point, but we made a minimum wage to, to be a living wage, and that is what got us out of the Great Depression. That's what got, got us out of the Great Recession. That is how our economy works when inflation hits. That is just how we deal with it. That is our system. Awesome, that'll be all. Thank you, guys. So we'll be going over topic one. Uh, we just got the results. Uh, and con one. Uh, is that it? I can get the vote? Okay. Con one, 25 to 22. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, a comment on the affirmative side pro. Uh, more evidence, uh, use of pathos, ethos, and logos. Uh, another comment on the pro side. Inflation continues to occur while wages do not uh, make it make sense. Uh, can, I, can I now have the pro and con for debate topic number two, and that will be the voting age should be lowered.
We'll now be hearing our first pro statement. For those of you who know me, you know on certain topics I hold an extremely conservative view. It might be a shock to some of you that I'm even up here debating for this topic. It might be a bigger shock that I personally chose to debate this topic. Maybe this proves that something needs to change. Pennsylvania has a flat state income tax rate of 3.07%. This is a tax taken out of each paycheck. No matter, your, no matter your age, you get taxed. Let's go back to our roots for a second. How did the United States become what it is? Well, the Revolutionary War kind of helped. How did we get to that? We got mad and decided to do something about it. Why were we mad? Because we were being unfairly taxed. What was that slogan again? Oh yeah, no taxation without representation. There are over <laughs> there are over seven million teens who work in the U.S. That is over seven million people who are being taxed and can't even vote. The only representation they have is writing a letter to a local government official, someone who won't even care, as said group can't even vote. So why even bother to take in their opinion? The number of youth workers is a big enough group in which, if they could vote, they could have overturned almost every popular vote in the history of our presidential elections. Think about that for a moment. We are taxing people without representation. People who could have, had, made, who could have made Mitt Romney went against Obama. McClellan went over Lincoln. Any candidate went over Wilson, Hoover, and Kennedy. These votes could change history. These are not just random votes we are talking about. These are your votes, your voice. Actually, these are all of our votes, all of our voices. Every person on this stage and the audience, yet the people sitting at that table over there disagree with me. You want to mute nearly everyone in here. You want to mute yourselves. Any opinion, any of you hold, is it valuable enough to you to make you want to do something about it? To make it be heard? If you're going to argue, to not let your voices or, vo or what? If you're going to argue, do not let your voices or votes be heard. You might as well come up to this podium with tape on your mouth, because you've already proven, just by taking that side, that none of you think any of our opinions matter, including yours. Thank you, Dalton. Uh, we'll now be here for our first song. Thank you. Can we get it again? The original United States Constitution gave white men over the age of 21 the ability to vote. The 15th Amendment gave everyone the right to vote no matter race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote, which happened in 1920. The 26th Amendment that was ratified in 1971 lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. The voting age was lowered along with the draft age. So if we lower the voting age, should we also lower the draft age, the graduation age, the age to purchase tobacco and alcohol products? What will we lower the voting age to? 16? They argue that if we are mature enough and trusted to drive a car and work a job, that shouldn't we be mature enough to vote? I argue that not all 16-year-olds are mature. I wouldn't even trust everyone that is 16 to drive me places or follow the traffic laws. I wouldn't even trust some of my friends to drive me from point A to point B safely. I feel tired. <laughs> At age 16, kids are still under their parents' roof, which could influence their decisions. They may have different opinions than those of their parents, which if they were allowed to vote, could lead to an increase in domestic violence and teen homelessness. Teens are also at sometimes easier influence than adults. Their friends and family can very easily influence the way they vote. Also, social media. According to psychologists, your brain isn't fully developed until the age of 25. If this is the case, then how can teenagers be mature enough to make informed decisions? If 16-year-olds are given the right to vote, then shouldn't we consider them as full-grown adults and have them follow adult laws and have the same adult consequences for violating said laws? Should we try them as adults? Should we lower the age to purchase alcohol and tobacco products? Should we lower the age of consent? Should we lower the draft age? 
Most 18-year-olds aren't even mature enough to make good and responsible decisions. How far are we willing to go to lower one thing? This one thing can lead to so many other things being lowered that could change the way this country functions. Thank you. Yes, We'll now hear our second pro statement. So as um, my teammate said, we're all, as young people, we're already expected to have adult responsibilities. Despite the fact that you may not trust your friends that are 16 to drive you, um, we can drive. I mean, I drove to school this morning. I'm here. I'm fine. Um, at age 16, you get a permit, and then six months later, you get your license. We're putting lives including our own, in the 16-year-old's um, hands. If we can trust a 16-year-old to drive a 4,000-pound hunk of steel, why can't we trust them to vote? Additionally, most of us already at work. We have jobs, as we just saw in the minimum wage debate. Um, we have full, full or part-time jobs. A lot of people I know are already at work by four after school, and some of us are expected to support our families. Um, additionally, um, as my other speaker said, we're already expected to pay taxes. In 2011, people under 18 paid $730 million in income tax alone. They had no representation in how it was spent. We're also expected to follow the laws, yet have no say in them. In every state, it's possible for a case to be transferred out of juvenile court into adult criminal court. In some states, 16 and 7 year olds or 17 year olds are actually automatically transferred. About 250,000 kids under 18 are tried, sentenced, or incarcerated as adults every year across the United States. Finally, we're already forced to be involved in politics. For example, we see young activists today fighting for gun control. March for Our Lives was founded by high school junior Cameron Caskey after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas tragedy, in which 17 students and staff were killed. We're, already, we're being killed and we're being forced to participate, yet we can't vote, we can't have a say in these gun laws and gun control that affect us today. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear our second calling statement. All right, well, I did some research. <laughs> Your peer research center over the four elections from 1996, 2004, 2012, and 2019, it shows that the young, that the people from 18 to 29 are the lowest percent of people to be voted, while the ages above 30 to 29, 50 to 64, and 65 plus are the high numbers. There's also a wide range in numbers. For, uh, for 1996, 16% of registered voters that are of age 18 to 29 voted. And, go, and the highest it's been in those four elections has been 17% in 2019. In another case, this is from the Electoral Studies Advisor, uh, Austria, a country in Europe, lowered the voting age to uh, 16 in 2007. Uh, and, and they did a, a survey on the European Parliament election of 2009, which, over which oversampled uh, uh, civilians of the age 20, uh, younger than 26. They used a self-assessed likelihood of voting skill of 1 to 0 to 10. Under 18, it was the mean score of people under 18 is a 5.91. 18 to 21, a 6.24 mean score. A 22 to 25, a 6.98 mean score. And over 30 is a 7.38 mean score. I have for census.gov. It's based on percents of people of that age. And those age groups are 18 to 29, uh, 30, uh, 30 to 44, 45 to 64, and 65 plus. And these, vote, these years for voting went from 1980 to 2016. The highest for the 18 to 29 year olds is 52% in 1992, and the lowest is 36.9% in 1996. So that, look at the graph, it was very, very inconsistent. There was high numbers and low numbers, but the other three gap graphs remained consistent. The lowest percent of people that are voted in an age group of not 18 to 29 was at 58.7 percent of people in the 2016 election, and that percent of people is 30 to 44 years old. So my point is, if you want the younger people to vote, why is it still the lowest number of people that can all the vote? Thank you. We'll now hear from our third positive statement.
colleagues have already stated, voting is a constitutional right. But right now, I'd like to talk about how lowering the voting age would actually solve another problem of improving voter habits. In America, we are facing issues of low voter turnout. Studies show that lifelong habits can take root as young as nine. If 16 and 17 year olds are given the opportunity to exercise their constitutional right, it can form a habit that will continue into adulthood. As my opponents have already stated, that 18 to 24 year olds have the lowest voting turnout, but that is not true for 16 and 17 year olds. In the Tacoma Park, Maryland, in 2013, they allowed 16 and 17 year olds to vote, and they had a four time higher turnout than their 18 year old counterparts. In addition, in Hatsville, Maryland, the 2014 Chicago primary, Norway, and Austria, they all had similar results with 16 and 17 year olds having higher voter turnout. Voting is our democratic duty, and we must act now to ensure the importance of this responsibility is instilled in our youth and secure the future of our republic. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from a third negative statement. Don't hope I can see over the podium. <laughs> One of these days I'm not going to be able to. It's going to be a sad thing. A 2019 Hill Harris X poll found that 84% of registered voters opposed lowering the voting age to 16. The poll found that every age group was against 16 year old voting, with the most support found among those under 35, and were still only 39% in favor. According to a study by the APNORC Center for Public Affairs Research, social media appears to galvanize young people to action. Teens who use Twitter are more likely to take part in a protest and express political beliefs. A poll from Common Sense Media found that only one in four people between the ages of 10 and 18 put a lot of trust in the media information they receive from news organizations. According to juryduty101.com, Every citizen of this commonwealth who is of the required minimum age of voting for the state and local officials shall be qualified as a juror therein. So basically, when you're, a, when you're registered to vote, you can serve on a jury. Do you really want 16-year-olds, do you really put your trust in these 16-year-olds who can vote to also serve on your juries? I don't. Thank you. We'll now hear the fourth positive statement. Good morning. Research shows that 16 and 17 year olds have the necessary civic knowledge, skills, and cognitive ability to vote responsibly. Waynesburg Central High School requires students to take civics class freshman year. We have enough knowledge to vote at the age of 16. We're already soaking in that information in our younger years of high school. Heck, not even high school years. According to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, it says sixth grade education provides a sufficient literary comprehension and intelligence to vote in any election. We are smart, we're educated enough, we have passions, big opinions on even bigger topics. It's time to let our voices and votes be in elections. It's time to lower the voting age now. Thank you. We'll now hear our fourth negative statement. The first speaker on the pro side argued that we're not arguing for voices to be heard, and that's not true in the slightest. We just believe that you should wait until you're fully psychologically equipped to make these decisions, especially decisions that affect the whole nation and not just yourself. Um, you also talked about how Waynesburg requires civics classes and they're not good. Anyways, uh, people under the age of 18 lack the motivation to participate effectively in the, in the electoral process. 18 is the age of adulthood and full acceptance of responsibility for your actions in society. Yes, a 16-year-old may be able to marry and have children, but once again, I fail to see why this in any way, shape, or form justifies participa participation in an election. Brain development doesn't stop until your early 20s. Even at 18, views are still forming. At 16, people were ruled by their amygdala, an area of the brain involved in emotions and not by the prefrontal cortex, an area involved in rational thinking and decision making. According to social scientists Tok Wing Chan and Matthew Clayton, 16 and 17 year olds would not be competent voters because research in neuroscience suggests that the brain, specifically the prefrontal cortex, is still undergoing major reconstruction and development during the teenage years. 
They added the, that the prefrontal cortex is what enables us to weigh dilemmas, balance trade-offs, and in short, make responsible decisions in politics. Based on this evidence, shouldn't the conversation be about raising the voting age rather than lowering it? While the government aims to increase voter turnout, kids under the age of 18 simply aren't mature enough to participate in elections. 16 and 17 year olds lack the political knowledge and life experience needed to participate in elections, therefore should not participate at all. According to Annenberg Public Policy Center, even American adults struggle with po po sorry, political knowledge with only 36% being able to name three branches of government. Lowering the voting age to 16 is not the right solution to have young people involved in this politics. Yes, you guys said that 16 year olds are allowed to drive, and yes they can, because they are at the right age to start learning about it and the responsibilities it entails. But they are by no means experienced. Teen brains are still developing and lack full adult capabilities for long term planning and thoughtful decision making. Thank you. We'll now hear our fifth positive statement. You guys on this side have touched on a, bit, a little bit of the social media aspect and the spreading of misinformation, but what forms of information and media are uh, students in our age, 16 and 17 year old uh, children, given that adults also don't have the same access to? Adults are subjected and radicalized just as the, virtually the same as we are. Adults are just as vulnerable. Think Facebook, for example, I'm sure many of your parents participate in Facebook, and Facebook is known to have a lot of false information. Facebook got six times more clicks than factual news during the 2020 election alone, and this is according to the Washington Post. Uh, um, Facebook's age demographic is also primarily 25 to 35 year olds, which 69% um, of adults use Facebook, where um, the, the, they are the voting age that you want to keep when they are g given the same misinformation that you would say that we are given and pushed to do. Um, not only are adults uh, subjected to this m misinformation and uh, they are to find um, information, there are ways to find information reliably as well. According to state.gov, you can check your information through politi PolitiFact and factcheck.org. We also collectively at this point in our age and schooling experience have been taught in school how to tell if your information is a reliable source or not. Thank you. We'll now hear from our fifth con statement. Oh, okay. Uh, so with the misleading part, a lot of people get misleaded on by social media, like you guys said. A lot of people of all age groups get misled, misled. But we have a prime example with the Russian and Ukraine conflict that most people of, of Russia are mis misled to basically hate Ukraine. So if we lower it down to 16, a lot of our younger generation are influenced by TikTok, which unfortunately they've got me as myself. So that being said, if we were to lower down the age, we might end up as the next Ukraine. Well now here are six positive statements. emphasize what my teammate Dalton opened with. No taxation without representation, a cause our founding fathers were willing to die over. Now, I stand here and ask, why have we not extended this liberty to the youth? 16 and 17 year olds pay taxes and are affected by the laws made by our elected officials. Do we not deserve to have a voice? We are driving, paying taxes, working without hourly limits, and in some cases tried as adults in court. Why are we being snubbed the right to vote? Every individual in this room obviously has an opinion on our world and our futures. Why should we sit and wait 
for the rest of the nation to deem us mature enough to have a voice. Thank you. We'll now hear our sixth con statement. Good morning. Um, I would just like to say for the taxation without representation, when it comes to the revolution, people in, were being taxed and obviously not being represented, and they complained to um, England and they said, we would like to be represented, and when England didn't comply, that's when they do their revolution. However, if England were hypothetically were to comply, people of America would come and they would vote and they would be able to choose on their how they would be taxed and what would happen. However, if we if that were to happen today, like we said before, lower age groups are like the lowest age of voters. Like people who are younger never vote. So if we were to have that happen, and we hypothetically in this situation, the people of America, only 10% of them would come and vote. So if only 10% of us are voting, why do we need representation for that? Along with that, we're still forming our opinions. Like, we have, adults aren't going to be swayed by social media because they've already cemented their opinions, they already know who they are in life. And us as younger people, whenever we're looking at social media, we're going to be swayed by the people we look up to and the people who we agree, want to agree with. So in the end, we'll just repeat their opinions instead of voicing our own. Um, just to sum up, uh, if we lower the voting age, who knows what else that could lead to. It could lead to a domino effect of lowering all sorts of things like drinking age, tobacco use, and anything above that. And we could be giving other responsibilities that 16-year-olds wouldn't be ready for. And yeah, that's about all I have to say. Go ahead and grab the microphones and we'll be open for table table discussion. Um, well, first off, I'd like to touch up with the last speaker that just went. Um, you mentioned alcohol age being lowered, and you also went over the no taxation without representation turning into a war. Uh, firstly, uh, the alcohol age and the tobacco age should be lowered, but that's a different topic. And what I'm getting at is you're bringing up points that, respectfully, don't relate to this topic in any productive way. I was stating that if we were to lower the voting age, as I said before, there could be an effect where we would start lowering things that should not be lowered, and we could have 16-year-olds could have all sorts of that's, responsibilities that they. That's an you know, opinion. Your that's your opinion that they shouldn't be lowered. It's actually fact-based that it shouldn't be lowered. Like developmentally, 16-year-olds are not capable to understand the full decision when it comes to an election. Okay, well I have one more question for the fourth speaker. So I believe that's you. Yes. You mentioned how people under the age of 18 shouldn't have a say in politics, they should just wait until they're 18, correct? No. That's what you, and could you summarize it for me because I forgot. I didn't say they shouldn't have a say in politics, I just believe they shouldn't be voting at that age. They can still be a part of movements and stuff at that age that affect politics greatly. I'm not saying they shouldn't have any say in it, because I personally, I mean, I'm 18 now, but even before I was, I had a say in it, but I didn't think I should vote. All right, thanks for your clarification. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah. All right, and I have a question as well. So, uh, I forget which one specifically talked about it, but it was talking about how adults were being exposed to social media just as much as children were, but the prefrontal cortex in a adult is fully developed, and it makes them help weigh dilemmas and see right from wrong. So how does that, how does them seeing the same thing as a child on social media, like, did you say what age it completely fully develops? The prefrontal cortex? Yeah. Um, mid to early 20s. Early 20s, you, uh, 25 just, specifically. We just brought it up, it says 25, you're allowed to vote at 18 right now, so. For, That's what I said, but this argument isn't about whether you should raise it, you're arguing that you should lower it. We are saying that we should lower it, and with the social media, um, the, the, we are all surrounded by it, so we have voters today that, um, 
are surrounded by it, that their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. We have ones that are, but can still fall victim to the misinformation. Think uh, of the elderly or older generations that have misinformation that fall victim to it all the time. And us as um, children, we have the um, means to figure out what is real and what isn't real, and we can take information from uh, there. And we also do have research that our brains are capable of being able to vote um, uh, on measure in the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science found that on measures of civic knowledge, political skills, political efficacy, and tolerance, 16-year-olds on average are obtaining scores similar to those of adults. Uh, ad adolescents in this age range are development developmentally ready to vote. Um, we also have uh, some brain uh, studies that have shown that there are other parts of the brain that are ready to I have a feeling you kind of just proved my point because you said that the prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed and yet 18 year olds can still vote. So you're basically saying that it should be raised and not lowered because you just said that the prefrontal cortex isn't fully That's, developed. Uh, that those are facts that, that, that it is They are facts and that's why I And I'm arguing that lowered. it should be lowered because that is not does not matter because we are ready. I agree, it shouldn't matter because in the 1975 they renewed the Voting Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Senate's Judiciary Committee claimed it is difficult to see why citizens who cannot read or write should be prevented from participating in decisions that directly affect their environment. So the government agrees that even if you are not educated enough or developed enough to vote, it is a right that our Constitution provides for us, and that is said. It should be extended to 16 and 17 year olds because they're no different than 18 year olds. Uh, age, yes, they are different. <laughs> Developmentally, psychologically, physically, they are in many ways different. This kid's developed enough to fly. He's not able to play. My life in his hands, but not vote. Can we talk about his speeding problem, though? <laughs> <laughs> Just because so, you're old enough to drive doesn't mean you're old enough to make decisions that affect the whole nation. You driving just affects mostly you and the people around you. Um, what's that one historical moment that affected the entire nation and was caused by a flying plane? Two, three of them? Your point makes no sense. They were terrorists. That's a whole different subject. <laughs> terrorists should not have the right to vote. What does terrorists have to do with this? Well, to rein everything in that's going on now, I have a question. Um, you talk about how adults are more mature, but I know many adults that don't participate in the um, elections and whatnot. And also, what really gives the, um, what statistics are there that of a maturity level? Because I know many adults that also, like, I don't know how to describe it, but many adults as well, maybe not have the same, I don't know. Well, you mentioned access adults. To information. You mentioned adults, you know, adults that aren't registered to vote. We should focus on getting them registered to vote instead of increasing the range. So you're talking about uh, adults being registered for votes? Well, besides what I stated previously, uh, that we like, stated previously about trying to get these younger voters in to vote, not only are we keeping the, um, these people from voting, but uh, we, are, we also, as a country, make it difficult for many Americans to vote uh, for many reasons. Our election days are held on Tuesdays when most of the world is on Sundays. We have a hard time getting people to transportation. And it statistically shows that low-income Hispanic or Asian Americans have more barriers to voting, and white citizens tend not to vote by choice. So what is your solution to get adults the poll rather than getting our uh, uh, Capable, very capable 16, 17 year olds. Not all 16 year olds can drive. A lot of no, adults can't either. So we're going to have their parents drive them? Can't that we also talk about their parents, family members influencing their decisions? I don't have it in front of me right now, but I also found that um, the 
uh, in areas that have t turned to 16 year olds being able to vote, it, drag their, it brings their um, parents into it too. So more parents and 16 and 17 years are vo voting, which increases the voting turnout. In a study of kids' voting program, parents, so the kids' voting program, uh, parents who had children participating in the program were more likely to vote in the actual election as well. Where? From kids' voting program? Yes. Is that a reliable source? Yes. It is an organization founded uh, to uh, increase the 16 and 17 year olds in voting. Doesn't mean it's reliable. I looked into it, all my information is quite reliable. All right, let's go with questions from the audience. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go right here, first one. Question for the pro side, uh, specifically that's speaker number one. You got a job. <laughs> yes. You pay income tax then, I want you to assume. I do. Okay, so how many other taxes do you pay? Say that again? How many other taxes do you pay? You pay your property well, tax? I pay, no, pay your water I tax? Pay, I get taxed on my paycheck. I actually had to pay resident tax a few weeks ago for just living here. Um, sales tax, that's a big one. Uh, yeah, that, those are the three, but they take a big chunk out of my paycheck. So, even though you are taxed, you're not experiencing the full range of taxation that you would post. Uh, whenever our founding fathers uh, went crazy about you know being taxed, it was on tea. It was on tea. That's a sales tax, isn't it? Was that was a whole different time. Even, even things like property tax don't apply to all adults unless you own property. What I'm asking though is, you as people who this whole idea is applying to, you do not experience the full range of taxation that most actual voters do. You're not, do you? Maybe, like but what is the full range of taxation when even some eligible voters don't experience all those taxes? Me there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question for the con side. So you said you don't trust 16 year olds, but my grandma, who is 7 years old, can still vote, ran over a cement block. Okay? My great grandma, who is about 94, who can still vote, has said raci racist slurs to both Italians and African Americans, and yet she can still vote. So, what's the difference between 16 year olds and letting, you said 65 and older mostly vote? So, I mean, should we let them be still voting? That's, um, that's not what this topic's about. It's whether 16 and 17 year olds, not 90 year olds. Yes, and I'm sorry right. for your grandma. <laughs> <laughs> but if, you know, the 65 and older are making these decisions, then why can't 16 and 17 year olds, 16 and 17 year olds make these decisions yeah, too? That's not our point. That's her decision to be like that. I mean, her opinion. But again, it was the time that she was raised in, so the time that we were raised in, it affects our decisions. In 10 years, she's not going to be here, and we're still going to be affected by the decisions that she made. They're still in this time, though. Yes, but we're going to be affected by the decisions that she made now. So why can't we vote for stuff that's going to affect us? Because of all the reasons that we just said. You're not development. You're not fully developed enough to. Okay, I have a question for you. What's the difference between your grandma being a racist and, let's say, another 16 year old being racist? They're going to be the future of either racist America or non racist America. Well, at least by now, they can, you know, the younger generation can learn. The older generation has been learning and they still refuse to accept it. I know, older, I know more 16 year olds that are racist than older people, to be quite honest. So this is
sort of for both sides. It's just a general question. The topic of this debate is, are 16-year-olds mature enough to be able to vote? Can we all agree on that? That's the topic? I would disagree with that because, as I said, I, it's, not about, it's not about maturity, it's about democracy. Yeah, are they, um, hold on, just give me a are second. Are they responsible enough to make the decision? No. That's how I phrase it. Should they be able to vote? They should be able to vote. Okay. Voting age should be lowered. That's yes. on the okay. pamphlet. But a factor that plays into that is maturity, right? That's something we're arguing. Yeah. The statement was made, <laughs> what's the difference between a racist 60-year-old and a racist 16-year-old, right? <laughs> That's Get back on the that was a public question. No more racism, it doesn't have to do with this. Yeah, that was because a public question. question. That's not a debate. The question of maturity. So you questioned yourself the, the difference in maturity between a 60-year-old and a 16-year-old, yes? Sure. Then isn't that the entire point of their argument? Didn't you just say that they're right? We're talking about voting age being lowered, not a cap at voting age. That's what I was trying to talk to her about. That's not what I... That's just stop, what I, just stop, just stop, just stop. Alright. Alright, this is a question for the pros. I got two. One's a yes or no. Do you all consider yourselves well versed in politics? Yes. Yes? Okay. Um, here's a basic question. Do you know our three Green County Commissioners? I'm not from Green County. From okay, County. you're an exception then. <laughs> you're also an exception. Who, who over there is not from Green um, I believe Mike Belding, he's a commissioner, correct? Yes, ma'am. No, what are the other two? You, um, they vary from county. <laughs> My point is, not everybody is versed in politics. No, but our point is, it's not a criteria. Not all adults could name all three county commissioners, yet they have the right to vote for them. Yes, they do. That's yeah. the point. Yeah. <laughs> right there. You name all three county commissioners from Green County? Where are you from? Yes, Me? Yeah. 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 I like Belvin. Get on your phone. Get on your phone. Yeah, I'm getting on your phone. Hey, I'm asking the questions here. You see, and he doesn't even know, so how. But I'm not supposed to be voting, right? Okay. Exactly. That's my point. He just said it. That's it.
The dress code is also hard against women of different sizes and shapes. For example, oh, sorry, for example, women who are on the taller end of the spectrum struggle with wearing skirts and shorts to school. Clothes fit everyone differently. There have been many cases where the dress code has applied to one person but not the other, even if they were wearing the same type of clothing. The development of a woman's body is completely natural process and that the dress code tries to go against. We'll now hear a third negative statement. The Carmichael's dress code is fair in promoting a safe learning environment, which is stated as one of the primary purposes of the dress code in the dress code introduction. The dress code stands against baggy clothing and coats in class due to safety purposes. It is far too easy to hide weapons, alcohol, or drugs in multiple layers of clothing. If a student happens to suffer from an ailment that makes them a little bit more susceptible to the cold, and therefore they would like to wear extra or baggy clothing, they can simply request a medical exemption. Refusing to consider a medical exemption to the dress code is, constitutional according, is unconstitutional according to education.gov. Therefore, students are able to wear extra clothing in class after the clothing has been searched for illicit substances or weapons. Further, the banning of headwear and sunglasses is important as such accessories impede the staff's ability to identify the students. Security cameras may not be able to fully pick up a student's face if they're wearing a hat or sunglasses, and therefore cannot identify them on cameras if an incident in the school is to happen. Further, due to Carmichael High School's lack of metal detectors and bag scannings, preventing some certain items of clothing is the best way to help ensure school safety. Overall, the Carmichael's dress code is trying to protect the physical well-being of their students via the school dress code. We'll now hear our fourth pro statement. One defense of the dress code is that it prevents male students from over-sexualizing their female counterparts. This argument is quite popular and similar to those used by rape apologists who taught the claim that people would be assaulted if they hadn't wouldn't have been assaulted if they hadn't dressed so slutty. But this logic is twisted. In a survey of the American Association of University Women, nearly half of all students in grades 7 through 12 reported that they, at some point, experienced a form of sexual harassment. This statistic is sickening, and schools should be doing more to prevent sexual ha harassment within their walls. But the claim that dress code is helping to prevent any harassment is baseless. We'll now hear our fourth negative statement. School dress codes protect the mental health of students, both male and female. With the different trends and styles going around, many students are adopting their own looks. Many teens are bullied for their choices of clothing and style. It prevents teens from being judged and becoming self-conscious of their bodies. It also stops teens from being able to make sexual comments and innu innuendos based on someone's clothing or jewelry. A quote from Independent Education Today says, feedback from the teenagers revealed that a consistent dress code meant they didn't have to decide what to wear each day or worry about whether they would be bullied or criticized by their peers. The study also found that a uniform promotes commonality among pupils, improves concentration, and fosters a sense of pride, especially when they wear it in public. Oh boy, we will not hear a fifth pro statement. You're good. Oh boy. 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 I was raised in an environment that stressed the importance of respect for those who were different, particularly those of the opposite gender. All my life, I've been shaped by powerful women and men who understood that the only way to prosperity is tolerance. Yet my school does not see me as a person who can exhibit veneration for my, sorry, veneration for my peers. It expects me to see female students as objects of sexual desire and doesn't bother to allow them to exhibit their personalities or styles. The dress code was designed to prevent the male gaze at the cost of female freedoms. It's just that. I have respect for my peers. And, I, and a great injustice within these walls is that my peers cannot enjoy the same expression as their male contemporaries for fear that they'll be victimized by this predatory system. Thanks. We'll now hear our 
fifth negative statement. The dress code still applies in reward situations, even in the office, stores, and de delivery services. It's a physiological fact that humans make assumptions based on what people wear. Dressing professionally can influence people's perceptions of you. If you would see a doctor walk into your appointment in a tube top or a muscle tank top, it would make you feel uncomfortable being in their care. This quote from Balanced Career states, the formality of our business attire makes clients and customers feel like they can't trust our ju judgment and recommendations. This teaches students how to dress respectfully for the future. Dress codes and uniforms are a reality of the workplace and in the adult world, and they're not going anywhere. We'll now hear our sixth positive statement. In my school's student handbook, you can find rules against ripped jeans, spaghetti straps, and loose clothing. My shoulders shouldn't provoke you. My lower thighs shouldn't distract you. An inch of my stomach shouldn't disrupt anyone's education. The school dress code is extremely unfair and perpetuates the sexualization of young women's bodies. Students should be held to a standard of tolerance, and the school should be held to a standard of respect. We'll now hear our sixth negative statement. Every school has a dress code, but some schools have uniforms too. So, would you rather have a dress code or a uniform? Dress codes give, some stu uh, dress codes give students some creative freedom with what they wear. They don't prevent much of what you wear. You can still wear short shirts that you want, you can still wear shorts in 90 degree weather, and you don't have to wear a skirt when it's 20 degrees outside. So really, dress codes aren't that bad. They're actually pretty nice. You guys can grab the mics. I think it is on the You guys are open to the same discussion, go ahead. You guys can go first. I don't know if my teammates have questions. Okay. So a lot of you mentioned that about uniforms, but this debate is about dress code. And uniforms, yeah, they limit freedom of speech. Dress codes also limit freedom of speech. I mean, I get not being able to wear a t-shirt that has a marijuana on it. Yeah, that follows. And we're also not saying dress codes should be eliminated. We're just saying that dress codes need to have some flexibility because my shoulders shouldn't distract you from your learning. Um, there isn't anything in the Carmichael's dress code that specifically goes against shoulders, and also I would say that overall, this dress code in particular, especially compared to my school's dress code, has very gender neutral language. Yeah, but mine doesn't. Um, I go to Brownsville, and like you guys said about bags and clothing, we go through metal detectors daily. And there's grants to apply to get metal detectors. I don't know if you guys know that or not. Like, there are grants you can get metal detectors, and I get that every school has affordability, but, um, like I said, I go to Brownsville. <laughs> we aren't the richest school, and we can still have metal detectors while keeping a positive dress code. Yeah, we have some flaws, and yeah, you guys said that Carmichael's dress code is fair, but my teammate just said that Carmichael's dress code isn't fair. That's the debate. Um, I guess the thing about uniforms is that, you know, uniforms, they they, cause, they force you to conform to what a, the, the exact things that the school wants you to conform to. This at least gives you a little bit of leeway on what you can wear, what you can express, instead of being conformed to the like navy blue and white uniforms that schools over in Asia have to wear. They have, women have to wear skirts. They, have, they can't wear pants. They have to wear skirts all the time. And personally, I do not want to be wearing a skirt in like negative 10 degree weather. I would prefer to wear pants. 
that's why we don't have any. This is against the dress code. <laughs> so I feel like bringing up uniforms isn't necessarily part of the argument. Um, we. <laughs> How about that Vicky? Anyway, um, arguing that literally anything about uniforms I don't think is that relevant to the topic. Um, I love wearing pants, but there's still regulations against them. So I truly do think it's unfair. I don't think rips are that big of a deal. I, like I said before, I don't think my thighs should provoke anybody. So that's pretty much what I have to say about that. I go to Mapletown and we have a school dress code that says that we are not allowed to wear ripped clothing, but people still do and because the teachers know that it's a part of style and it's not harming anyone, it's not distracting anyone, it's not, oh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> They allow us to wear it and no one gets dress coded. The only reason that people usually get dress coded are because they're wearing something obscene or it's just, you know, too much in a public school environment. Um, I know you guys mentioned some statistics about some other students being dress coded from different school districts, but do you have any specific instances from Carmichael's itself and how this dress code is implemented? Because I see that a lot of your issues are not with the policy itself or the direct language in the policy, but how certain teachers are choosing to implement the policy which is a kind of a different issue. Um, personally, in Carmichael's, I don't have statistics, but the amount of times monthly I get pulled to the side because of a specific shirt I'm wearing, maybe showing this much of skin, um, the skirts I'm wearing, it's truly ridiculous. I got pulled to the side for a skirt that was very similar to the skirt I have on today. You know, down to the fingertips. Um, I have on to the side uh, because of spaghetti straps fully covering the front of me, the back of me. I have gotten pulled out of class for multiple reasons like that, and I think it's ridiculous that I am getting taken out of my classes and my learning experience for something I feel comfortable in. It was hot that day, so I wore a spaghetti strap. It was hot, so I wore a skirt, and I don't think that that should take me out of class and take me away from learning, personally. Uh, I just wanted to clear up that um, our dress code is mid-thigh, and um, as a person that's never been dress coded before, I do wear ripped jeans every day. And mid-thigh is pretty fair. They changed that in the recent years because so many people couldn't find shorts that came down to your kneecaps, because wasn't it an inch above the kneecap that it used to be here? So it's definitely evolved for the better, and it's definitely evolved to cater to them more, to find pants that are, because it is very hard to find, but that's maybe not an issue with the dress code, but trying to find clothes that fit into the dress code is maybe something that's wrong with the companies and not the dress code itself, because personally, when I walk into uh, chain stores, I it's hard to find a shirt that's not a crop top, as a female. But also you were saying how people should be to, should be dressed appropriately, and I understand that. But it, the issue with dress codes being unfair is that it's so inconsistent. Because I can wear one top, but someone who's built differently, different than me, it could be a low cut a low cut shirt the same way that mine is, and they'll get dress coded, whereas I won't. That is policy implementation, and not policy directly. And going back to what you said earlier and what my colleague said earlier, it's really about how the teacher implements it. I have, like you, almost been dress coded where I was showing about this much of my stomach. It wasn't very much. I went the whole day. I have eight periods. I went seven out of eight in my periods and even had my strictest teacher that I have at that school compliment me on my outfit. And yet, eighth period, I walked in and my teacher pulled me aside and asked me if that was too revealing. But that's how she felt on the topic, or on my outfit, not how any of the other teachers felt about, about it. So isn't it the way that the teachers implement the dress code policy rather than the policy itself? Um, 
And it's also important to note that literally every school has either a dress code policy or a uniform policy. And I think that if you would compare this to other dress code policies, it is extremely fair to the students and not ridiculous in nature. And as we said earlier, I believe the quote is um, um, provided that the dress code is written clearly and is not excessive, it is fair and constitutional. I have a question for something um, speaker number two initially mentioned. It was about uh, regarding safety, which I have enough questions about that in and of itself, but more specifically, um, identifying trespassers. I'm really not sure how the dress code involves trespassers whenever, as you can see, looking around, um, no one, at least from Carmichael specifically, is uniform in what we are wearing. If someone came in was a trespasser, uh, we wouldn't be able to tell, and I don't think that's part of what we're talking about. Safety in itself is not part of the prompt, but trespassers was just really a random thing to mention. It was just part of the statistic. So something else I have to say is, you guys said that the dress code helps implement learning, but according to a National Women's Law Center study, three out of four DC public high schools allow staff to pull students out of class for dress code violations. So, you're eliminating kids from class time by pulling them out. That's not keeping kids focused on school, that's doing the complete opposite. So, wouldn't it be better if they adhered to the dress code? Because if they didn't adhere to the dress code, that is why they're being pulled out of class. Okay, but you also just said that you didn't adhere to the dress code? I did adhere to the dress code. But, but my but teacher put, took me out of my class because she felt that my clothes were too revealing. Yes. But the dress code states that or in our dress code, I was perfectly fine. Yes, but how did that make you feel? Because when I got dress coded, I had anxiety for years about, oh, I can't show my shoulders because then, oh, that's going to go on my record. Oh, that's going to affect my college. And yes, I get that anxiety doesn't affect everyone, but you know the amount of stress that puts on someone just to think, oh my gosh, I have to follow this dress code or else it's going to ruin my career. And a lot of kids suffer from that. Um, I do sympathize with that because I do have similar issues, especially with showing my legs because I do have a bit of longer limbs, but what are you going to do in a work environment that requires you to dress a specific way for, say, an office environment? Okay, so I've been in work environments. Um, I have presented at multiple things. I have been in a program that made me present in front of a group of people like this, and I wore business clothes, and some of the business clothes included a short skirt. The skirt went against my dress code, but yet, at that environment, I wasn't dress coded because no one cared. Yeah, it affected everyone. Everyone saw my thigh. Everyone saw my thigh. Like, that's fine. So what would happen if you were in a, say, like, mine, um, you were a doctor? How do you think that would make your patients feel if you showed up? Um, yeah, but that's a uniform. This debate is about dress code, not uniform. So you're kind of going against the debate topic. Um, well, dress codes help set that. You're paid to go to your job. We have to be here. <laughs> In a professional environment, I have to wear khakis. I have to wear a black shirt. I can wear pants. And I'm paid to be there. And if I didn't like it, I would leave. Like, but I, I do not have a choice. I have to be here. I'm not going to be dress code. I'm a dude. These rules were written against girls. It's plain as that. So it, the implementation of the dress code is something that we can argue against. But why shouldn't girls be allowed to wear something that reveals their shoulders? Why? As Speaker 2 said, I am a woman. I do get yeah. angry about certain stereotypes and other things like that. I don't like it. But I dress the way I like to dress because it's for me. It's not for other people to look at. But I follow the dress code exactly. and I try to adhere to that so I don't get pulled out of school. I don't get pulled out of my class. I'm not embarrassed by it because I like the way I look. And if I like the way I look, I don't want anyone else to talk to me. So I'm going to follow the dress code so no one else has to compliment or comment on what I'm wearing. But what if someone likes the look, how they look whenever they wear a crop top? Or because you're saying that you follow the dress code and you're comfortable with that. Well, what if someone wants to wear something that's not entirely inappropriate, but it doesn't fit the dress code? They feel comfortable in that. They're not 
dressing it appropriately, but it's just against that specific dress code. You don't always have to wear it at school, though. There's other places to wear that. You could wear it going out to the store, or going out with your friends, going to the movie. The but this is about school dress code. But what you're saying is that if they are comfortable wearing a crop top, they don't have to wear it at school. They could wear it somewhere else, and they could adhere to the dress code at school and wear that crop top somewhere else in their life. Doesn't that limit self-expression? <laughs> All right, questions from the audience? Okay, so I'll pass around, but I have a question first. This is for the con side. What about sports? Volleyball? Um, their shorts? Those are definitely against the dress code. What about those? There, there's different dress codes for sports. Whenever you join a sport, they give you a packet. Yeah. And it tells you what fits in the dress code. It used to be that you had to wear khaki pants to your volleyball games. Mm -hmm. I think that, that was just an Emma thing. So I was talking about very big on khaki. <laughs> That's <laughs> that could very well be true. But there's 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 um there's different dress codes for different sports. Well, I was talking to Macy this morning, and she said that um the athletic trainer told them that they can't go down to the field house out of the locker room with their shorts on. That's just dog. That's a dog. The, but, um, my uh, friend actually has the same role, but she was actually from uh, Virginia, and that's just how she grew up. She grew up um, just presenting herself as a professional, and that's the way she is. But nobody is making you wear those shorts. You have a choice to wear longer ones, athletic shorts, as long as they are black. You can see college players playing in leggings. Nobody is forcing you to wear those shorts exactly. So if you're not comfortable, then you are not forced to wear them. Well, um, what truly gets to me personally is the reason that I can't wear my volleyball uniform to get stretched or taped from my athletic director. Um, every time I ask about the dress code, I'm told it's because boys will be boys. Every time I ask my athletic director why I couldn't wear my volleyball uniform down in the field house, it's because boys will be boys. So cycling back to what I was saying before, this is all sexualizing women at a young age. Um, I think it's ridiculous that I cannot get taped for my volleyball game in the athletic director's office because boys will be boys. Yeah, that's not that's not a set um, like school dress code rule. That is our athletic director's rule because she doesn't want anything like discrimination to happen. All right. Questions? Oh, okay. So for the pro side that dress code is unfair, are you suggesting a removal of the dress code? No, um, none of us said that. We only said that we would like to lay off some of the things, like such as visibility of rips in your jeans or shoulders, stuff like that. Not saying, oh, there can't be a dress code. None of us said that. I see, but when you make the rules less, more broad and vague, that's where we see problems in the execution of the dress code. If the teacher can look at it and interpret it in many different ways if it's not strict enough. So would, would you want a less, would you want a stricter dress code or a more broad one? A more broad one. <laughs> but then that leads to the problems you addressed where- Like what? You get, Suspended for having shoulders, midriff, shoulders. That's why the dress code's going to be broadened. So we, so we yeah. don't get suspended. But if you broaden the dress code and you're still unhappy with it, would you would you suggest that we broaden it even more? Yeah. So we're just going to keep broadening and broadening until we're comfortable with what the dress codes are. Yeah. And at that point, anyone <laughs> can probably wear anything. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> so again. Uh, why can't someone wear something showing their shoulders? Why not? Well, that, that, if, if I can help. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Well, well, okay, well, my, well, my statement was because you're too broad, people can, teachers can interpret it in so many different ways to where they can, they can enforce themselves onto students, and that's where many of the abuses come from. Oh. Huh? <laughs> okay. 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 okay, I'll repeat myself. Because these rules are so broad, that's where many of these teachers, that's where they can abuse the dress code and send these students to the office. If you have stricter rules, 
in the dress code saying you cannot suspend a student for showing this much skin. That would be a better dress code, would it not? Okay, but what if, here's a crazy idea, okay. we just said, oh, don't wear t-shirts that reveal drug use. And then we don't have to say anything about Dean, but yet that is strict enough so you know to send a kid to the office with a drug shirt, not as one with revealing skin. So there are ways to get around that so you can be strict. Strict enough that you know what you can send a kid to the office with, but yet fix society standards that we can wear whatever we want. We'll do one more. I have a question for this side. Um, so you guys have touched on how the teachers have interpretations of these dress codes and how different teachers will punish different things and how that's okay, but I feel like this is losing focus as to how you want one strict like um, dress code, you want a dress code, but if you think it's okay that different teachers can sway in and about, how are you planning on enforcing a dress code that is not followed by everyone and you're okay with that? We never said we were okay with it, we just said it's an instance that occurs. But you weren't attacking it. You were a lot you were using it as um, a driving force in your argument against the other side saying that these um, these teachers will uh, like the fourth uh, lady said how she went through multiple classes a day being fine but then finally got to one that didn't and that you were using that as a point to benefit yourself but actually how does that not um, attack yourself in the sense that you're not supporting your idea of one sound um, dress code. Uh, what we were saying is that the policy is fair and that the issues that most students have with the dress code is when certain teachers interpret it in, in certain ways. So what we're saying is the policy itself is fair, but people tend to have trouble whenever they're wearing something that really isn't against the dress code, but a teacher decides that day that they don't like that that student's wearing that thing. So then doesn't that still make it unfair if it's being enforced in this way? The policy isn't unfair. The Rules can unfair. only be as good as their implementation. Yes, do you so. have a plan or idea on how you would stricten and make it one sound? Like, do you have ideas on how that would occur, a solution? Even in regular life, if I go out on a crop top and shorts, someone is going to say something to me because they don't like it, but other people might like it. So really, you know, you're never going to get we're, something. We're talking about the dress code in school. You're never going to get something that is strictly followed by everyone because everyone has different interpretations of everything. But you're, you're going to see that in school, you're going to see that in a business place, you're going to see that outside of school. It's not just in school. All right, let's get the papers. I'm so sorry to that, dude, I didn't mean to cut your question. I just felt bad. That was rude of me. Freedom and Restoration Act, um, religious and cultural headwear is permitted, even if hats are banned. 
Um, that's in, is that in Carmichael's? Uh, this is um, a law. Well, it's yeah. not abided by because the dress codes are sexually and racially motivated. My other question was that you stated, I believe it was speaker number five, that um, something about professionalism and you wouldn't go to the doctor's office if your doctor is wearing a tank top. So if you're allowed to come to school wearing sweatpants, which I conferred with some Carmichael students to, believe, to know that it applies here, but a girl cannot wear a skirt, how is that preparing you for a professional environment if you cannot wear sweatpants, but if you can wear sweatpants, but you cannot wear a skirt? Um, you're allowed to wear skirts here. It has to be six inches. Okay, so six inches on an incredibly tall person, how does that correlate to somebody that's not tall? If you know you're not allowed to wear something, why would you continue to wear it anyways? And what I'm trying to say is... Because I should be allowed to wear a skirt. Because um, also, as you are allowed to wear a Actually, not mid-by, it's whatever's closer to me, so that's not You're afraid to it up. Okay, we got results. <laughs> <laughs> Does this dress code as a whole, though? So. Okay, uh, pro 1, 35 to 16. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, folks, uh, I want to thank, thank you all for attending the debate today. Um, Every school got a different, uh, slightly different policy on this dress code. It seems to uh, have some folks fired up a little bit. Uh, but we thought overall it was argued fairly well, um, all things considered. Uh, we appreciate everyone's efforts speaking. We'll remind you that our next debate will be at, on Thursday, April 24th in Brownsville. 28th in Brownsville, and we'll hope to see you there. Thank you.